Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. We are here with a very, very, very special guest. Somebody when I started traveling, showing up in Grand Slams, and there's a guy walking through the cafeteria with a blazer and these crispy white tennis shoes. It's like <laughs> this was this was Stan the man before Warinka. This is Stan. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, you know, one time I wanted to to stand at Wimbledon and he's wearing his Stan the man shirt. And I said to I said, Stan, that's what they used to call me. And he says, they still call you that. It's okay. Right. <laughs> you should have trademarked it, man. You could have the shoe, the phrase. Yeah, well, uh, Stan Musial, I think, had that first, but uh, there, it's been around for a long time. <laughs> so I was in a meeting just last night, a dinner meeting uh, at the Goodman Theater, and a guy uh, had on the Adidas, Stan Smiths. And I said, I'm interviewing that guy tomorrow. He said, who's he? I said, the guy whose shoes you're wearing. He's like, oh, what does he do? And I said, well, he's one of the greatest tennis players of all time. I said, that's how the shoe came about. He's like, oh, well, I just love the shoes. I don't oh, like well, tennis, right? That's not the first time that's happened because, uh, you know, a lot of people now, unless they're 55 and over, probably, uh, probably never saw me play the game. So that's normal to see that. It's great to see that, uh, that guys like that and, and young girls and young boys and babies and old people still wear the shoe. Right. <laughs> and then I've got another friend who owns a clothing store, uh, sort of an urban streetwear store in the South Loop. It's called Success. He's actually yeah. a former NBA player. And he's got Stan Smith, you know, 10 different versions of the Stan Smith shoe. And he was like, well, I don't know who the guy is. I know he played tennis, but these shoes, we can't keep them on the shelf. Uh, <laughs> and so it's just, it's just amazing how um, you created sort of a brand off the court that, um, you know, that lives on, you know, 40 years later. Um, but I want to talk about your playing career, right? Because I think people know you for the shoe, but they don't know. 1968 NCAA champ, former president of the Tennis Hall of Fame, 1971 U.S. Open champ, 1972 Wimbledon champ, uh, USC Trojan, which is a we all know in tennis is a great tennis school. Yeah. I mean, before the shoe, that's a hell of a playing career. But how did you get your start in SoCal? Because, you know, when I think about all these tennis pros, you know, we all had a lot of people help. And I know you had the, the San Diego tennis pra- patrons help you as well. How did you get into tennis? Uh, well, it's really uh, my uh, I had two older brothers and they played a bit. My father actually coached at Pasadena City College. Uh, he coached tennis as well as other sports and uh, he never really coached me too much but uh, a group of, of parents in my area formed this, this tennis patrons uh, association they hired Pancho Segura who in my opinion could be the smartest uh, coach that's ever played that's ever coached the game he was a great player himself uh, and uh, he was a little guy but he had to use his brain to to, to win and his legs and uh, he transferred some of those thoughts and uh, ideas. He worked with Connors. He worked with Chang. He worked with a lot of players along the way. Uh, and uh, he was great. And so I used to, every Saturday morning, we'd go to Pasadena High School, which was not really a country club situation. And, <laughs> and uh, they had kind of pink, beige uh, tennis courts, peachish color, color and, and hard wire nets. You hit the net and it would bounce up, you know, 20 feet. So <laughs> we did that every Saturday morning and I and, uh, got to to learn the game and, and then start playing tournaments in the area. And then uh, USC offered me a scholarship, uh, not until the May of my senior year. I mean, he was trying to get other players and he kind of got stuck with me because everybody else turned him down. But, uh, uh, you know, it worked out great. He, he's coached, you know, Olmedo and Osuna and Ralston and, of course, Lutz and, and Ramirez, a lot of great players over the years. And, and they not only became good players, but they won majors, you know, like Almeida won Wimbledon in the U.S. Open, Osuna won the U.S. Open, Ramirez won a, a few doubles titles uh, along the way in the majors, and, and of course Lutz and I played, and Ralston won some majors, so it was, uh, he was, uh, in my opinion, the best college coach ever, you know, Dick Gould, 
certainly won more uh, titles, 17 titles, but uh, George totally would, I think they won 10 titles in his, mm -hmm. his coaching career. So, uh, but he coached guys that became great players, you know, on the international scene. And uh, it was, uh, it was a great experience to be there for four years at USC. Mm -hmm. Now you did something that we don't see a lot now, and that is 1968 NCAA champ and three years later, Grand Slam champion. How did that transition happen so quickly? I mean, that was, you know, Arthur Ashe was competing. I mean, there were some people who could play in the game at that point. So it wasn't like, oh, it's old days. You just walked into the, onto the tour. Well, it was a gradual thing. I won the national junior championships in 64, and then went to college, won 68. And then, uh, you know, was able to, to really play tournaments during my college days in the summertime. I played, you know, five or six, you know, tournaments against these top players during the summer. And then once I graduated in 68, I got to play Davis Cup and then, uh, you know, just went right on the tour and played those same same guys in the same tournaments in the summer. Then, of course, you know, year round. So I was able to to get some good experience early on during college. And uh, I was the last guy to graduate from college to win a Grand Slam. Now, Arthur Ashe was the last guy. He graduated before me and he won a Grand Slam after me. But uh, we were the last two to win Grand Slams to finish college. Uh, now, how did you finance your career? Because in those days, you win a Grand Slam and you get a, a handshake. You didn't necessarily <laughs> get a check, right? So no, how I got a check. I got a check. Uh, the guys right before me in 68 got a warm handshake <laughs> and, uh, and a, a coupon for maybe a sweater. But uh, when I won the U.S. Open, I won $20,000. And when I won the uh, Wimbledon, I won 5,000 pounds. So it was uh, not the same as today, but uh, it was more than just a warm handshake. Yeah. <laughs> and then you go on and obviously have a great career, lots of doubles titles. And at what point did the shoe come about? Because well, the shoe came about in 71. Uh, the shoe had been created by Horst Dossler, who was Adi Dossler's son and a guy named Robert Haye, who was the number one French player. And the shoe was created in France uh, in a place called Landersheim, which is in the border of France and Germany and Austria. And so uh, they wanted to get a stronger presence in the United States. And I was American player number one in the world at the time. And, and uh, so we worked out an agreement. They were looking for a great looking guy to put on the, <laughs> on the, on the tongue of the shoe, a great face. And they couldn't find one. So they, they, they got me. And uh, so they, they put my face on the tongue. They had Robert's name on the side and had several, several iterations of the names of both names and that sort of thing. And finally, after about four years, I took his name off the shoe and it was just my name after that. And then they took the shoe off the market in 2012 and 13 uh, and we had the meeting in 2011 when they, they alerted me to that. Uh, I wasn't too happy, but uh, they came back with a vengeance in January 15th of 2014, and uh, it, it, it went crazy after that. They did a lot of things with collaborations with uh, hip hop you know, artists and that sort of thing, and, and uh, people that I didn't really know very well at the time, <laughs> uh, but uh, they, the kids knew them. And so they really marketed to kids from 18 to 24 which I thought was a mistake because I thought those kids wouldn't know who I was. But uh, again, they had collaborations with people that the kids did know. Uh -huh. Pharrell Williams and uh, Stella McCartney and, and people like Kate Moss, different people like that. Now, you know you've made it when Jay-Z says your name Yeah. in a song. I mean, every NBA player, LeBron, Dwayne Wade, they always talk about the highlight of their career. They knew they were like making it when they heard their name in a rap song. So when you heard your name in one of Jay-Z's songs, what did you think? Well, I heard about it. My daughter, who was about 13 or 14 at the time, came home and said, Dad, you're famous. I said, what do you mean? I said, well, Jay-Z has in one of his songs. And I said, well, that's great. You know, who's Jay-Z? <laughs> <laughs> I did find out about him a little bit more. He, he was, I was in a few of his songs, but uh, it, was, uh, it was funny to see. Uh, I'm just here in my Stan Smith whites, uh, just chilling and uh, that sort of thing. So it was, uh, it was kind of fun to see that. Well, you know what's funny is that that is what I think tennis needs more of. 
is branching out and having other people, personalities push into the sport yeah. to sort of help grow it, right? Because we talk about prize money in 1971, 1972 being $20,000. But I mean, we look now where NBA players are making $35 million a year, right? And the only person, only tennis player I know that did that was Naomi Osaka. And that was off the court. You know what I mean? Nobody's making well, that on the court. Yeah, Federer's, well, Federer's <laughs> making that off the court too, but, uh, yeah. and so is probably Nadal and Djokovic, but uh, on the court, you're right. They're making 10 to 15 million, which is uh, doing okay. But, uh, you know, it, the, the off-court stuff has been, uh, has been exciting. And, and we're seeing more and more of the, of the players getting off, like Osaka and, and uh, others that, are, that have made a name for themselves. Certainly Serena and Venus have done pretty well off the court. Oh, I mean, they've like, you know, the list of names you, you say are some of the ones that have transcended the sport. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, popularity and branding, et cetera. Um, but I think, you know, your shoe brought, it brings people to tennis um, and makes them think about tennis all day. And now you see people with, well, with business. I'm hoping, I'm hoping it'll be some way to kind of bring everybody together and, and a common, you know, bond that people wearing that shoe. And uh, it's, it's, it's fun to see. My, my favorite thing is to see a girl and a mother wearing the same shoe because most girls wouldn't be caught dead wearing what their mother's wearing, you know, and, and, or their father. And so I, I, it's fun to see a, uh, a father-daughter pair wearing those shoes and, and, uh, and enjoying it. Let's talk about Davis Cup, because when I think the Davis Cup personality, um, you're at the top of the list, right? And we see now the restructuring of Davis Cup, of Fed Cup, now called Billie Jean King Cup, sort of trying to keep, um keep that model alive right keep the the sort of the yeah about the good old davis cup days where it was like hostile territory yeah yeah it was uh it, you took your life into your own hands when you went to a place like romania or, or Colombia, and, and uh they were they were uh rabid fans that were supporting their team which was fine and and it was it was one of the most uh difficult Things that we played in Spain, where we had uh, people flashing the, the mirror in my eyes as, as I was serving. We went to Chile, where we had a death threat on Dennis Rawson's life. Mm -hmm. uh, went to Mexico, and, and the, the people were so loud, you could barely hear uh, the, the umpire calling the score. And then, of course, in Romania was the ultimate, you know, where he had uh, uh, very tight security because these Israeli athletes have been killed before at the Olympics. And therefore we had two Jewish members on our team, Solomon and Gottfried. And, and uh, we had very, very tight security the whole time. And uh, they, they kicked out some of the, uh, uh, the terrorists from the city, you know, before we played that Davis cup match. And it was, uh, you know, the umpire was totally intimidated by the, by Tyriac and, 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 uh, so it was difficult conditions, but, you know, certainly looking back, it was uh, the highlight of, of my competitive career because of all you had to go through. You had to put up not only with the players who were difficult enough, Nastasi and Tyriac, but with all the fans and, and uh, the, the, the pressure of, uh, of playing in those conditions. People I'm most curious about your era. When I was growing up, and I was the only person in my life to play tennis, and my friends used to Arthur Trash, right? That was like my nickname growing up. Uh, so give me a good Arthur Ash story. Well, there's a lot of stories about Arthur. Uh, you know, the uh, he was one of the great uh, ambassadors of the game. Uh, not only to the United States, but around the world. And he had a he had a T-shirt, and it said "Citizen of the World," and that was his favorite T-shirt. And he really wore it well, not only physically, but he was, uh, you know, beloved. He's like Feder, you know, around the world, or Nadal. You know, they're really loved by all the fans in every country. Uh, and I remember playing Davis Cup in uh, Australia when we won the Davis Cup the first time 
uh, his dad came and my parents came uh, to observe that. I told him we're going to win this thing. And so they came down and uh, his father was a disciplinarian as a policeman. And he, he forced Arthur to, you know, to respect others. And he, he in general, um, tried to, you know, it was a tough situation in a tough sport. It certainly in, uh, in Houston one time, he wasn't allowed to change uh, in the locker room and the men's regular men's, men's locker room he had to be in the junior locker room. And that was a difficult situation. We, uh, we went to Africa together and uh, Frank DeFord, Bud Collins and um, Richard Evans were the two reporters, the three reporters that came with us and they traveled the six countries we went to. And, and so we would play a match. At that time, I was actually ranked number one in the world and number one in the United States. And uh, they would introduce Arthur as uh, Arthur Ashe, the, uh, the, the number one player in the United States, the number one player in the world, the greatest player uh, in the world who has ever played the game and his opponent, Stan Smith. And so <laughs> we, I had to put up with this. And, and he, uh, he finally came up and said, look, you know, I understand this is difficult. Obviously it wasn't his fault, but uh, he said, if you ever do a tour of Alabama, uh, I'll carry your rackets for you. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he and I were, were really close and I'll, I'll never forget sitting in my office when I got the call when he told me he had the HIV and, and it was uh, one of the lowest days of my life uh, because we played at the AT&T golf tournament. Uh, it was called the Crosby at the time. And he and I were paired off with two pros and we played there a couple of years together. And ironically, uh, the day that Arthur died, it was Saturday of the, uh, the Crosby tournament, which I was playing at the time. And, and, I, and I got the message that that Arthur passed, and so I called Jeannie, and and uh, I was right there where we had uh, had so many great experiences together. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, he was uh, not only one of the great players who won three Grand Slams and played unbelievable Davis Cup matches, but uh, but also was a great friend and and a great leader of the ATP. Mm. And Ilya Nastasi, when I think of like fiery personalities, right, pre. John McEnroe, right? We we John McEnroe, Jimmy Connors, but Nastasi was like the five before they came. Tell us about Nastasi. Well, Nastasi was, uh, you know, he was harmless off the court, but on the court, he would either go crazy or at the end of his career, he kind of realized that some of the things he did could really throw you off. And primarily it was, uh, you know, arguing with the umpire or the linesman or whatever and changing your rhythm. So you're in a rhythm of playing, you're concentrating, you're focused, and all of a sudden you have to wait for literally three to four, five minutes to wait for the conversation to be over. Uh, but he was, he was so uh, good as a player, you know, that he could, he could do things and he was used to kind of disrupting the flow of the match uh, that, uh, you know, he could run down balls. He was very quick. He had a great flair for, uh, you know, hitting the ball on the run. And um, he developed a good serve. He's sort of a, a natural player. He had a nice forehand. His backhand was a little bit weak. And, and uh, I would actually ignore him. I'd try to ignore every, his antics. And that would drive him more crazy. And he even wrote in his book that uh, that, that was a problem. He hated it when I just kind of turned my back. And the people who were watching thought I wasn't having fun. But if I kind of played along with him, I'd lose my focus, my concentration, and, and uh, he'd get what he wanted. So uh, we had in, we played each other four times in Davis Cup. And uh, I beat him the four times. And we played, him, played each other, of course, the Wimbledon final. Uh, but he beat me a couple of times in the Masters uh, final. I won the first Masters, but he beat me in the next couple in the finals. And uh, so we had uh, we had some real battles out there. And, and uh, he, he, uh, he one time um, I, I, I've told kids that you got to sometimes act on the court. And in this case, it was in, Palm, it was in uh, Las Vegas. It was like 100 degrees. And he was whining about how hot it was, how windy it was and all this stuff. And I was dying, but I just pretended like I wasn't hot at all. And uh, 
after the match, he came up to me and said, well, you, you didn't, you didn't seem very hot. I says, I was dying, but I wasn't going to let you know. That was about <laughs> 10 years later. It wasn't right after the match. And he said, oh, I didn't know that. I said, well, that's what I was doing. I, I was trying to, you know, act a little bit and, and get in your head. Yeah. So you go on, uh, and we've seen lots of players uh, go on and have tennis academies, uh, but very few as successful as you. Uh, you've got the Smith Stearns Academy in Hilton Head. One of my players actually moved down there to come to your academy, Mia Toman. Uh, oh, Mia, yeah. Mia, yeah, yep. And then she's yeah. a freshman in college now. Yeah. Uh, but she, I had her back when she was hitting orange balls, right? And I was fighting with her parents over what size racket, you know, should we move to 26 inch? Should we keep her in the 21 yeah. inch? I, mean, I yeah. remember all those uh, conversations. So tell me about that experience now, starting an academy, how you made it so successful. Cause we've seen people, you know, have little academies and it just sort of come in, fizzle out. Yeah, it's tough, you know? it's tough to keep them going. You know, uh, Billy Stearns and I started the academy 20 years ago, 2002. And, uh, and it was a matter of, uh, the model that we used was we'd have, you know, uh, the academy in the morning and in the afternoon and in between players get to get lessons. Uh, we had a fortune to have a school that worked with us as far as time of classes that they could, they could use. And of course, a lot of kids were doing homeschooling or online schooling in order to do this. And uh, then we take kids to, uh, to tournaments. And now we've got eight bands that we're taking kids to tournaments in and, and uh, the kids are taking private lessons where we, we take the kids to different places like to college matches to see them, to have them see college matches because the thing that can really inspire kids the most is to see kids maybe just a little bit older than them, but in a competitive situation. Certainly in college tennis is really fun and exciting. We've also taken the Davis Cup matches uh, so they've been able to see that tennis at the very highest level and international and, and those things are motivational to, to young players. And so, um, we're, we've been able to, to do that and to, to have some fun, uh, on the court, but have them really work hard. And so Billy's son now, BJ Stearns has taken over as the director of the Academy and he's doing a great job. And we've got, uh, eight coaches now that were, that are working, you know, every day and, um, and you know, the kids, it's really fun for me to see the kids improve mm -hmm. and to prepare them for college. And our goal is to get them kids to be at a college that's appropriate for their tennis and their academics. And if they have the ability to maybe move on after that to play professional tennis, then, uh, that's sort of a bonus. But, uh, you know, as, I was director of coaching for our US program and we had some of the top players in the country be top players in the world, but not really be able to make it in the, in the world in the world of tennis because in the pros because it's so tough. And uh, so we're we're trying to get them ready to have their get the fundamentals strong enough that they can hopefully continue to build upon it. And if they have the ability to, to move on to the next level, then uh, maybe they will. Now Having been in the game or in the in the academy game for 20 years, you've had to have the conversation, right? And I always say the conversations when a player moves to the city to train at the academy, they're investing a lot. We know that you make that kind of move with the hopes of going pro. But you and I look at it like, yeah, probably gonna like, you know, not that college is a bad thing, but college is probably as far as they're gonna go. How do you have the conversation? um about when they say hey what do you think my kids chances of going pro I, I always just say it depends right yeah uh you know, it, it, we the conversation is exactly with the better players in the academy are that uh, look let's let's work as hard as we possibly can i remember jared palmer back when i was the director of coaching for our usda program uh he felt that he couldn't play professional tennis if he went to college. And I said to them, you know, there are a lot of players that have done that, at least for a year or two. You know, you had even Connors and McEnroe go to college and, and Malibu, Washington, uh, Arthur Ashe, of course, uh, Todd, Todd Martin, oh, yeah. players that went for a couple of years and, uh, and had very successful 
uh, college careers. And, and uh, finally convinced Jared to do that. And he went to college for two years. He won the NCAAs. Then he went into the pros and he was ready to go. So um, I've been an advocate for college tennis and we're seeing that today. We're seeing, uh, you know, the guy who I think is going to be maybe the next great tennis player is Ben Shelton. And, uh, <laughs> and I saw him play for the first time in the Australian just last week uh, in a couple of matches. I hadn't really studied them too much, but this guy has got uh, – a uh, huge serve, a uh, great, great forehand, very good backhand, moves pretty well mm -hmm. um, and competes well. And and he, he's gone to college for a couple of years and he's even going to go to college as he's playing pro tennis to, to study, but not playing the team. But so I think we're seeing some players that have gone to college that have made that, uh, you know, for a year or two and have made the transition in the pros and, and have done great. And uh, I think that that Ben's going to do that. Uh, but we also have some great young players now that are, it was great to speak at the, at the Australian to see eight American males in the round of 32, 25%. That hasn't happened since, uh, you know, the area of, of, of Agassi, Sampras, Courier, Chang, Martin, Malavai, all these guys that have been good pro players and have done well in the, in the slams, but we haven't seen that since then. So, I'm very excited about it. You know, Ben, of course, Corda, Fritz, Tiafo, uh, Brooksby. I mean, there's a lot of players that fall oh, the yeah. semifinals. It's, uh, it's really exciting. But in our academy, we want to, you know, give the, the parents and the players a little dose of reality that all they can do is work as hard as they possibly can and give it their best shot. And if, they are, if they're capable of doing the next level, then it'll come about. Now, I always talk about college tennis. Uh, me and Tommy always joke about this. How he wanted to go to North Carolina and they wouldn't offer him a full scholarship. Uh, this is Tommy Paul? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was his dream school. They wouldn't give him a scholarship. Wouldn't give him a scholarship. <laughs> wouldn't give him well, a full the, scholarship. My coach was not too excited about giving me a scholarship either. So some coaches, uh, you know, take a while to learn. Yeah. <laughs> Tommy, that's the miss. So, you got a book coming out uh, and a documentary. Give us a little, for, for those who like the Cliff Notes version, give us a little look inside the book. You know, I got, I'm a man when I got a kid in college, two kids that are six and seven. So I'm just going to take me some time to hide in the bathroom and make it through the book. Give me some <laughs> stories that I, that I can skip to to kind of entertain myself in one of my little 10 minute bathroom breaks. <laughs> well, the, the book is a, is a coffee table book. It's one of those things that, uh, that there are stories that are about two pages long okay. and there's stories about my career and there's stories about the shoe. And so I wanted to, to, to get this book done so that it would before some people who had been involved in the shoe died or involved in my career. And so we've had, uh, you know, short stories from, uh, from players and from designers and from, uh, you know, advocates, uh, from friends of mine. Uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, we, Arthur's not in the book, but, but Arthur's wife, Jeannie, is in the book, and she's a good friend of ours as well. So, uh, well, just it's, a, it's one of those things you can look at for 10 minutes or 15 minutes and then put it down and come back. It's got photographs of probably a hundred different uh, colors and types of shoes that you can see. And it really goes through the history of the shoe and, and as well as the history of the highlights of my career. So it, if you don't like the book, you can get it and you can use, you can do curls with it. It's five pounds. <laughs> so it's very heavy. And, uh, and because of the book, uh, LeBron James has a uh, production company called Spring Hill. And they looked at the book and they said, we want to do a documentary. So we did the documentary this last year and had a great um, director out of LA that, uh, that, uh, that did it. And uh, we're excited about it. And they're looking now at, at finding a home for it and uh, getting on TV. Very cool. Well, you know, you talk about lifting weights. You and I are both skinny, wiry guys, right? So yeah. it's our yeah. never ending journey to, to bulk up. Uh, now I always have to ask the question, Stan Smiths are known as a casual shoe. Had you ever considered, given the fact that Adidas and Nike sort of like fight for that top spot, Adidas has got 
you know, Garbina, I mean, they got a ton of athletes, uh, Felix, yeah. right? Had you ever considered making a playable version of the shoe, right? Where players can actually wear it <laughs> and compete in. That's the next step. Well, you know, the, the fashion world and, and the, and the uh, demographics there are a lot bigger than a group of <laughs> tennis players. And so uh, it, it has become a, a fashion shoe. Now, having said that, they did the uh, Audi Zero, which is uh, kind of a commemoration of uh, my 50th anniversary with Adidas. And so the players have gotten that and uh, it's got my name on the, it actually has the, the score of the match of the fi Wimbledon finals on the tongue of the shoe and the inside mm -hmm. tongue of the shoe. So they did that to commemorate the 50th anniversary, but uh, uh, they've got, you know, uh, the barricades of course have been uh, the great Adidas uh, performance shoe, and they keep coming out with another generation every year that's going to make a little bit better. The bells and whistles and, 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 the, and the support systems uh, in the shoe are going to be much better than my shoe. My shoe hasn't really changed in over 50 years. And mm -hmm. uh, so it, it has been, it's become a shoe that people like to wear, you know, just uh, chilling out. And, and, uh, and it's really been fun to see people wear it where they're not being paid to endorse it. I mean, you see, you know, the president of the United States, Obama, you know, and you see Trump's wife. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, it's fun to see people wearing it because they like it and not yeah. because they're, you know, they're being paid, paid to play it. Right. Yeah. Well, man, this has been a real treat. I've got five or six pair of stands. I got the black version. I wear, I actually wear my black Stan Smith's, uh, a presentation so instead of wearing you know the ah. traditional dress shoes yeah my blacks my blazer and my black stan smith so it's become a staple in my wardrobe now that uh i feel like that the corporate world is loosening up in terms of fashion you no longer have it's to ready traditional it's dress ready shoes. it's ready for the sneakers i mean people wearing sneakers doing everything and and uh people are getting married in it uh, they're doing the <laughs> meetings in it that i like that uh, there's five guys who went to international tennis hall of fame legends ball and they're young guys about 30 or so and they're in a beautiful nice uh, black tuxedo with the white shoes right <laughs> they, look, they look great i want to thank you for coming on the show um you're a legend not only in the fashion world but in the tennis world your presence as you walk through the cafeteria or walk through the site is still there i don't know if you know that um but you know we look up to you we, we're grateful for everything you give to the game and I'm grateful for you for coming on the show. So thank well, you. you keep giving up to the game what you're doing and, and uh, appreciate that as well. We'll get a few more champions out there. You know, yeah. like Sloan and, and uh, Mia and those people. So keep it going. Thank you so much. Take this care. has been the Tunis.com podcast with Stan Smith.